Cool. Hey, how's it going, everyone? How's, how's your protocol berg morning starting? Yeah, good, good. Nice to see familiar faces. Um, today's workshop really is a primer like for understanding what, what, as I see, the underpinnings of Polkadot uh, and Polkadot's application space. So if you already have some familiarity with Polkadot and, uh, and you know, what we mean when we say this, that, that, that there's an exciting emerging application space, well, you probably know a lot of what I'm about to talk about. But if you're completely new, you'll probably learn something. And um, I will say that I started with sort of just a talk of presenting concepts, whereby um, the, a lot of ideas have been coming over the years for me to, to think about this application space. And this is me sharing this. And because it's a workshop, I've also kind of turned it into something. Yeah, you can, oh. I hear myself really loud. <laughs> Thanks. And because it's a workshop, we'll also have a little bit of hands-on stuff. So my name is Sasha. I've been working with Parity for uh, two and a half years now on the developer relations side of things. Um, I'm really thankful for the organizers here for putting this event together and to have me sit here and talk to you guys and show you guys um, what's really been my passion over the last couple of years. Um, so yeah, this workshop is designed to help anyone who's new to Polkadot understand the basics behind how to think about this application space. And, and really, for those who are already familiar, hopefully this is also like something that you can um, adopt in your mindset of thinking about this application space. So I really, I want to open this session today with, with this statement that for me, sets the scene, it sets the tone of, of kind of where I've arrived for, for thinking about um, uh, what, what we're talking about today. And that, that's this concept of programmability. So uh, programmability really is a superpower in which we have now arrived to a place where um, we, we have a lot more freedom as developers to, to build uh, some prosperous application space. So this is a, I was trying to make a napkin sketch, but we're out of napkins in the parity offices because all the protocol engineers are super busy developing. So I had to use A4 paper. Um, some of you probably will get that joke um, if uh, you've been around and seen some, uh, um, some things happening in the Polkadot ecosystem. But really what we're looking at here, it's uh, a space upon which user-facing apps can be deployed. What it's starting to look like is that apps are powered by multiple services that are offered by multiple networks. So you can welcome Mum. That's, that's Mum. It's just a human user. Um, we'll be referring to her throughout this workshop. And she's our prototypical end user. Um, and our goal today is while we unravel what this, des this dev stack is, well, we want to keep her in mind, right? Where we're actually at is that Mum has no idea what we're talking about. Um, Mum is wondering, what are all these blockchains? What do you mean they're powering decentralized services? So there's been a lot of improvements to make this multi-chain application space user-friendly, but it's still getting there. What I would tell Mum is, I'd say, Mum, it's, it's just about services, services. Right? And I want to give it a little bit of background on what makes this app space feature rich as I'm trying to describe it. And to me, it all starts with this concept of programmability. So if we look back on the earlier days of Bitcoin, what really whet the appetite for wanting to create a new class of applications was the, the lack of programmability. We wanted to program, we wanted to be more flexible. We wanted to create more um, comprehensive applications that use primitives that were presented by Bitcoin. Applications that are resilient to centralized power and accessible to all people. Ones that can be programmed using smart contracts. So smart contracts being this next stage in the era of programmability. Um, now, what we're looking at this diagram, really just a brief view, is that 
with this focus on, on interoperability, uh, Polkadot being this multi-chain uh, um, network of blockchains, we've kind of come to this completely new approach to programming applications, uh, being able to create your own blockchain designed to handle any type of specific logic. So some examples of specialized chains, for, for instance, are ones that can specialize in managing assets, uh, which we'll see in this workshop. Like I promised you, right, we're, we're kind of we're kind of going to be looking at some theory, and then um, you, you guys can take a look at some examples. There's also probably a specialized chain to manage on-chain governance logic. Um, others that really are specialized in offering core protocol and infrastructure. So think storage, think uh, identity management state, uh, chains. And really, my point here is that there is this new era of composing application logic by composing with the underlying services provided by these specialized chains. So one way of thinking about this multi-chain thesis is it's a shift of a mindset, really. Um, it's a shift from having a single world computer designed to host a whole bunch of applications of a whole array of business logic to thinking in this world computer paradigm, one more of uh, a network of connected specialized computers. Um, so what does this Web3 dev stack look like at a high level? To me, it looks something like this, where um, at the very bottom, we have this core infrastructure that provides services to power end user experiences. And as we work our way up the stack, we can start thinking about writing cross-chain programs that bundle these services to, op to offer features to other app chains as well as front ends. Because remember, we should be really caring about MUM. So our focus today is, is how uh, this stack applies to developing applications on Polkadot. Um, we'll take a journey through the stack, as I see it, starting at the foundation. And hopefully then, once we kind of get further up, we'll, we'll uh, kind of wrap things up with, with uh, w w some leaving thoughts and takeaways. So we'll learn how cross-chain programmability can compose features of many specialized chains and what this means for MEM. So you can scan this QR code uh, to sort of see that something I prepared for you, which is a readme, if you're interested in following. Super quick, like, does, uh, how, many people have, how many people in the room have Rust installed on their computers? OK, so I made a really great assumption, which is that we're not going to have enough time to actually run code. <laughs> and, and if there's only a couple of hands in the room that said, yes, I have Rust installed in in, on my computer, that means that um, if we were going to run some code, I would probably spend at least 30 minutes trying to help you guys install your right tool chains and get your environment set up. So our goal for today is just to introduce how chains connected by Polkadot can communicate with each other and offer a seamless user experience. So the whole, the whole, my, my whole design for this session is um, to, to present the high level pictures, look at code, uh, and you can check out the links that are provided in this um, readme that I, pre uh, that I prepared for you guys. But to kind of like toggle between like this high level, like I want you guys to leave with at least an understanding of what this dev stack looks like in, in practice. And um, so first we'll look at what composes a specialized uh, logic of a chain. And this is called the runtime and its modules. Then we'll have a brief look at types of message protocols that chains can adopt with a focus on Polkadot's native message passing protocol called XEMP. As we progress, follow along the examples, you'll literally see that I've kind of organized uh, the readme as per the slides that we'll be seeing. Don't get ahead of yourselves. Lay back and wait for me kind of to go through 
uh, this, the, the, the stuff that I have ready for you today. So the goal really is to familiarize ourselves with cross-chain programmability uh, as being this key enabling layer for the app space that I'm really talking about. Um, curious to know if anyone in the room has already sort of done stuff on Polkadot and maybe built some things on Polkadot. Um, yeah, there's one hand up, two hands up, cool, three maybe, three, four, cool. So yeah, um, let, oh, I, I, let's have a brief look at it. What does this look like? Uh, so I just want to show this readme for those that uh, just want to see it. Uh -oh. There you go. Oh, no. That's not it. Um, well, I don't, I don't want to mess up the, the presentation, but essentially it's made up with links, and the purpose is for you to kind of follow up, and it's like a good starting point after this workshop where you can kind of dig deeper and, uh, and discover yourself. So we're actually just programming state machines. Don't tell mom this, right? Because it's way too complex to kind of comprehend, but hopefully what, this, what we can do in this time we have today is to debunk what this really means in the Polkadot developer stack. Uh, yeah, so I, I kind of had fun like kind of doing some drawings because, um, you know, really we need to think about mom here and this is me saying like, hey mom, so applications on Polkadot can talk to each other by using special runtime modules. Make sense? Let's dig deeper. So constructing runtimes, what is a runtime? In the Polkadot developer ecosystem, there's this thing called substrate, and it's a framework for building specialized blockchains. The runtime of a substrate blockchain is what contains all the modules that defines its specialized logic. So at a high level, um, in terms of the node architecture, we've got the runtime and the client. So the client is all of the networking protocol logic, all the consensus, uh, all, everything that's off-chain that's required to run the state transition function, which is the runtime. And um, well, to get a little technical, what's kind of really cool about a substrate blockchain is that the runtime is actually just the WASM binary. Um, and what you can think of it, yeah, so the, 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 web, the, the, WASM, the WebAssembly runtime um, is, is, is the state transition function of a blockchain, of the substrate blockchain, and the WebAssembly executor really is the client-facing side of, of a node. So it sort of looks like this. You have a runtime, uh, and you can construct it using all sorts of modules. The term we use to define these modules is a palette. And a palette is just some Rust code used to encapsulate some callable logic that's stored on chain. Make sense? So at a high level, the runtime of a chain contains a bunch of modules. And some can be operational modules. In fact, every blockchain will need to have some sort of like underlying operational uh, infrastructure, uh, such as timestamping, such as uh, core libraries that enable it to you know, talk to the, out the outer node, the client. Um, it'll also have some consensus-related functionality and others that encapsulate what, that, what makes that chain specialized. So for example, a specialized a chain that's specialized in managing assets will have modules to offer asset management like functionalities, which, which we'll actually see in, in these, uh, uh, these tests that we're gonna be looking at. So let's look at an example of an example mock runtime. Um, here, this would be the first example that I've provided in the readme, you can check it out where um, this is, so this is a mock runtime, right? So this is the reason that I chose to look at this, this code base of mock runtimes and uh, testing uh, in, a, in a sort of unit test environment is because it's, it's far, far less complex and there's so much complexity with actually looking at the code base of a full node and running that in a like full node network setting. 
but um, this kind of gives an idea of, of what you could expect in a runtime. Again, it's actually just doing something super simple. It just contains the ability to manage fungible and non-fungible assets. So the, the notable modules to check out here is the palette balances, um, which is a way to manage user balances, and palette assets, uh, as well as palette uniques. So yeah, see the, the mock runtime examples in the worksheet? Um, so hopefully at this point, we have this kind of high level overview of, of uh, being familiar with the concept of a runtime and runtime modules. In steps here, we call them palettes. Um, but this is really just important because the next part, we're going to take a little dive into how chains, substrate chains, can be equipped to speak to each other. And by extension, like how these chains that are secured by Polkadot can actually send messages natively. Uh, so yeah, let's dive into like, what these cross-chain protocols might look like. So I want to I want to just paint the picture uh, of of the different types of protocols you can expect, um, and start also by reminding ourselves like why we why we might be caring uh, about these protocols um, for mum uh, because ultimately we we make decisions on on the types of things we want to implement the types of tech we want to use and want to present that generally there's two classes of cross chain protocols there's uh, in, in trusted cross chain messaging which verifies um, the messages by using some trusted authority, like attesters or some exter external validator set. And by nature, these are more prone to attacks. So you know, we, we want to be thinking about the trade-offs and using certain technologies. Um, there's some use cases for using these technologies that are very great. And there's maybe other instances where maybe we can do better. Um, we're focusing today on, on this trustless settlement, which uh, really is message processing that doesn't rely on trusting an intermediary and uses validators of the network to uh, process those messages. Uh, so yeah, you can actually find examples that I put in this work about this in the worksheet. I kind of try to give a, a layout of the technologies that I know of, at least, that paint this picture of trusted and versus trustless settlement layer. Now there's something interesting here is that you can see that I put in the trustless settlement layer um, protocols that are more uh, that, that that are designed to operate in low trust environments, and others that are designed to operate in high trust environments. So um, systems that don't rely on some trusted authority really have different trust assumptions. They're said to operate in low trust environments or environments where trust is already established between chains, um, and. The beauty is that chains connected by the Polkadot relay chain actually share the same security, which implies that these chains already have some high degree level of trust. So if we can assume that two chains already have some degree of trust, we can use protocols that leverage this assumption to create efficient ways to send messages between chains. And um, for the sake of kind of keeping things focused, uh, I do provide some examples. You can like read more into them, but we will be looking at XCMP, which is uh, Polkadot's uh, native uh, message passing protocol. And I just want to emphasize this: like we actually have uh, you know some superpowers here because Polkadot parachains are secured by the same validator set which is one of the core offerings of Polkadot, which is what we call this shared security model. And just a high level way of thinking about it, it guarantees the faithful, faith, faithful execution of messages. So think like if you um, are in a, uh, a, a low trust environment and you need to make transactions that touch multiple chains, well, if, you, if those chains can't really trust each other, then um, uh, there's a chance that uh, some execution of a message doesn't, doesn't uh, go through and gets attacked or whatever. And that really results in poor user experience. So one of the superpowers of, of the, 
the the uh, protocol that we're about to check out is the the ability to ensure faithful faithful execution. Um, <clears throat> so let's get let's get back to pilots, right? So we kind of just gave this overview of what pilots are. We can build runtimes and um, the the notion of trustless messaging protocols in high trust environments. And why we're talking about this is because we have this thing called XEMP that can guarantee uh, uh, faithful execution of messages. So Polkadot parachains use a native messaging protocol that's designed to send and receive these messages. And really, what's important here is in this framework of like the programmability layers um, is that really we, we, we're, we're creating a virtual machine inside of the runtime of, of, our, of, of these chains that can talk to each other with essentially an instruction set that can interpret and execute messages as per some defined protocol. So what's, in, what's important to know here is that the, the distinction between each of these definitions is, is, is relevant insofar as we have uh, a, a message passing protocol that's like the rules in which the, the, the message can, is, is expected to execute and the paths it will take to execute. We have this XEMP, uh, sorry, so XEM, which is just the cross consensus messaging format, meaning it's just a format. It's a general format that the, this virtual machine would expect. And um, the virtual machine itself, so the instruction set that interprets and executes XEMs. So again, like we're, we're kind of skipping over a bunch of complexities, but I just wanted to give an example of actually like what you would see inside of one of Polkadot's um, system chains. It's, it's a blockchain that is managing assets. So essentially what you can see here is that there's a bunch of XEM helpers and like together you, you can think of this as um, composing this virtual machine. And by the way, in the uh, simulator examples that's linked in our worksheet today, we're actually using a mock runtime of, of the asset hub. Um, so at this point, we can use instructions to write cross-chain programs. And that's pretty powerful. Um, a a, a cross-chain program really is just a set of instructions that can be executed across multiple chains. So what does this really mean for the end user of such a program? Remember, we, we kind of want to think of, well, I'm, I'm pushing us to think about mum, about this end user. Well, the, the, the truth is uh, all of these users can, can be either accounts, they can be contracts, they can be other chains. Um, they can be also people. But what we want to keep in mind is this layer of programmability uh, that's there to express an end user's, uh, a user's goal, no matter what user type. It's, it's, not, it's not there to um, define like how they will achieve a particular thing, but really uh, these instruction sets can empower us to think about what our user wants to achieve, whether it's a chain, a smart contract, or a person. Um, and a, and, and a, you, an end user should never really know about this instruction set. So now talking about this human user, um, in the human user example, it would really just be interacting with some user interface that uses some JavaScript library that abstracts this layer entirely. And I put in an example of uh, such an SDK that you can check out in the worksheet. So real quick, user journey here. like. We have a marketplace that just launched a feature where someone can uh, sell limited personalized copies of their work. Um, and Mum wants to give, it, one, Mum wants to just get a limited edition of her friend's recipe book. Right? So, some user journey where, you know, we have a user that um, will quickly lose the, 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 the ability to, to get done what they want to get done if they really have to hop around chains. Um, so, Let's, let's think about mom, right? So she wants to get her recipe book and um, we, wanted to make, we want to make it easy for mom to achieve her end goal. That's really the point here. We don't want her to have to manually move her dot from one chain to the other and then go and mint on uh, another chain where that collection exists. 
and that would be a, a headache. Also, uh, you know, we, we haven't really looked, talked about like fees involved in here, but uh, ideally, like we want this to be packaged in one call, um, and we want her to just sign one transaction to do that that job that to, to reach her goal. So JavaScript frameworks do exist to abstract these complex interactions. Um, developers can use these to focus on providing those features to the end users, that abstracting away the fact that they're powered by the underlying chains. But under the hood, you know, we have this instruction set. So um, one of the things in the worksheet, you can actually see what this code looks like. You know, you're just packaging a message that, um, uh, that, that encapsulates the instructions that, so are giving instructions for the virtual machine inside of the chains that can talk to each other this way. And uh, so I, I've, I've also linked to what all these instructions, I think there's about 48 instructions currently today um, with the current version of XCM. And essentially, it's doing a bunch of things under the hood that helps us really create abstraction layers to help mom achieve her goal. So I kind of want to recap, like, um, first of all, like, has, has, who's like kind of, has someone opened the, the code base? I'm curious, like, have you seen like what this actually looks like? Um, so the XEM simulator is, is just this test, this, this unit testing framework that's designed to test out these instructions. Uh, so it's kind of, I, I really recommend it to like, as, as a primer to kind of learn about what we're talking about today, which is this, this programmability layer, uh, which, is, is so important when we're building applications on top of Polkadot. So to recap, um, the underlying infrastructure of Polkadot's app space is made up this, this concept of runtimes, right? So we've got runtimes that can really be powered with different cross-chain messaging protocols. And um, we, we also looked at you know, the, 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 how they can be formed, pallets and stuff. Um, and integrating cross-chain protocols, how XCMP works at a high level. But really, the, 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 the key thing here is that um, specialized chains that, ne that leverage native inter interoperability should be abstracted. Right? We want to have, we want to create frameworks that are abstracting these layers. And um, the, the choice of protocols that we use also are a very good indicator of the type of user experience we can expect. So some takeaways, like we're really creating the foundations for, for user-facing apps. Um, and they're apps that can offer services that are powered across multiple chains. But it's important to keep in mind what we want to enable the human users to achieve. And with that said, um, I think that it's super important to, 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 take, to, to like take a step back from thinking about the blockchains that are really powering this infrastructure. I think it's, it's much more beneficial to, to start looking ahead and looking at like, what abstraction layers we can create to make these user experiences as seamless as possible. So app developers can provide user experiences that are powered by multiple chains and really should be abstracting this for end users. Um, that's pretty much it for, for what I wanted to go through today. I, I'm, I want to leave time for some questions now, so please feel free to shoot. If there's any questions. Um... So... Right. Do you want to repeat your question? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So the qu the question is like, how does Apollon fit into this whole um, perspective, and and just. So my knowledge on Apollon is that they're actually creating these abstraction layers. They're making it much easier to use these interfaces. Um, and I mean, 
I think what Apollon is doing is spot on, right? We need more frameworks. We need to, with with this like, what Polkadot as a network is, is really creating is, is uh, a bunch of services that ultimately you want to compose different services to create some rich feature in, in whatever application. Um, Apollon is the only ones that I know of that, that are doing this, and the the, the challenge is that like you want to have as much flexibility as possible. Like you want to have frameworks that don't make too many decisions for you at the same time, but at the same time you want to be as flexible as possible. So um, to answer your question, I think yeah, like that is exactly sort of in the right direction for sure. And really, the the, the key is that these these cross chain programs like we need to think about like. The, those, those cross chain processes being like some programmability layer where they make abstractions around the core infrastructure themselves. And on top of those, we have things like Apollon, things like SDKs. I, I shared one SDK in the, in the notes uh, that, that does this for us. Uh, if there's no more questions, then thank you so much.